Hello, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. Also, blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. We call it a real election channel because we cover everyone on the ballot. LibertarianProgressive.com is an independent media organization. We interview independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot. We believe if a candidate is on the ballot and has gathered enough signatures and has a statistical chance to win, then a responsible media will include them in the debates interview them to educate and inform the public of their options and i'm absolutely delighted to have over 35 interviews so far actually we're close to 40 now at libertarianprogressive.com and these are candidates that are the only third party option in their district or their area and today we're interviewing bruce griffith libertarian candidate for the u.s house of representatives district number four in colorado you can visit his website, BG, which stands for Bruce Griffith, BG2016.org, dot O-R-G. And Bruce, welcome and good evening and good to talk to you today. And hello, and please tell us about yourself and why you decided to jump in. Is this your first time running for office, sir? Good evening, Thomas. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, this is my first run at elective office. I'm an engineer. And I've been looking at the way our government's going, been going over the last 20 years. Things have really struck me about uh, how much government spending is going on, how we're in deficit spending. And at this point, we've got a debt that's going to be nearly impossible to eradicate. We have the highest uh, national debt that we've had since World War II. And even if you look at that, that debt was spiked very quickly based on the spending for uh, for World War II and then was quickly paid off. And at this point, we're going on six years of having a crushing uh, a debt, and it's continuing to grow. And if we continue to, to have our debt growing at the rate that it's growing, we'll be at the point where the interest payments will make it so that we can we can't get it paid off and so I'm an engineer I know that we have a a lot of professional lawyers in Washington engineers look at things differently engineers look at problems as problems and the assumption isn't that there are sides in an argument the assumption is is that there's a problem and that it needs to get solved and so that's what engineers do they figure out ways to solve problems. And so that's why I'm running. It seems like there's a lot of lawyers. Lawyers might be important in some aspects, and not to say you have to be a lawyer to respect the Bill of Rights or understand fundamental principles and freedoms. Um, absolutely. So talking about the budget, we're about 19 to $20 trillion in debt right now. It's counting. You can visit that website that shows the debt clock. It's constantly ticking up it's kind of like the event horizon like there's a certain point where you supposedly if you go near a black hole the gravity gets so you know you get to a point where there's no turning back i think that's what you're saying how would you uh you know what where where would you cut where would you raise taxes how would you tackle this what kind of time frame you know 10 year time frame 20 year time frame one year time frame what's the best way you think we would uh deal with this debt and budget issue? Well, Bill Weld has a quote this year, and uh, I love this quote. Um, he was asked on, a, on an interview show, so, you know, how do you, how do you cut spending? And he, his answer was, the only way to cut spending is to cut spending. Um, and so that's what we need to do, and we've got a lot of sacred cows. Uh, I'll give a, an easy answer to, to to touch, but it doesn't do much to the debt. Um, And that's Amtrak. We have a national rail system. It's profitable in the east and wildly, wildly unprofitable in the west. Now, don't get me wrong. I love Amtrak. I've ridden it many times. I've taken it across the country with my family many times. But it doesn't run on time. I've arrived from Denver into Chicago uh, more than once, six hours late. 
you know, and that's over the course of a day, it ends up 25% late. I can go on and on with the stories about it, but we spend a billion dollars a year subsidizing Amtrak. If you look at the, the ticket prices, you pay about the same price that you'd pay for an airline ticket. And the amount that the government kicks in to subsidize your ticket if you spent $400 for a train ticket, the government would be kicking in somewhere around $300. So it, it, it's it's just not cost effective. So the answer to to cutting spending would be to do things like take Amtrak and uh, privatize it, give it back to the to the public sector or private sector. So. You sell it to somebody, you let them make money off the eastern routes, and if the western routes are can't be made profitable, you end them. That's what you do in business. And, you know, the debt is a serious issue because, I mean, like you said, again, about the interest rates, I mean, if um, we don't want to get to a point where the whole budget goes to paying interest, and, and that's what happened to, you know, or that's what was starting to happen to other countries like Greece and some other countries in Europe and South America and you know it has happened before so uh, that's not a situation we want to be near so the wise thing would be to see what's coming see the iceberg and move out of the way per se let's look at some specific issues I mean one thing that a lot of people has their have their sacred cows as you say so some people propose like a penny plan where they just cut one cent out of every dollar across the board. That way everyone, and then there's a sequester that is currently happening right now. What, what about, uh, let's look at some specific areas. Do you have on your website the war on drugs? Is that something, you know, maybe you could cut more than one penny out of that program. I mean, so let's look at some programs where you could cut more than one penny out of. Uh, what do you think about the war on drugs? Is that something we could cut? more than one penny out of every dollar to help the budgets? Well, I suspect you're not going to get a lot of traction out of that. You will get some, but uh, if you end the war on drugs, you release about 50% of the people who are incarcerated, which means you don't have our overcrowded jails, which means you're not buying new jails, um, but these are local issues. In the federal government, you're reducing the size of a few relatively small organizations. So I, I don't know that that's really going to help a lot. There are, there are some big ones, just, just some broad, bro, broad brush numbers that are uh, huge. Cost of a carrier to operate, single carrier, is something like $6 million a day per day. And we have 10 of them. Um, yeah, aircraft carriers. Next, yeah, aircraft carriers, and that's that's the the whole battle group. But countries, uh, uh, not our enemies, but competing countries, Russia, China, they each have one. We have ten, plus we have nine auxiliary carriers that are you know something else yet again, and their carriers are the size of our auxiliary carriers. So it's just, just to show how overbuilt we are. Um, we've got a carrier being built that's, uh, I don't know how much it's over budget, but it's it's way over budget. Uh, the cost of it's going to be $10 billion. I think I've done the math and you end up with about $10 billion that, that um, uh, sorry, I believe it's $1 trillion that we're spending per year to operate all of our aircraft carriers. It's a huge amount of money. Um, and so maybe the Defense Department is a place that might have more than a penny per dollar to cut. Now, how would you balance that while having, which I assume that you would want to have, the strongest defense out of any country by far in the world? So we do need a strong defense. We need to be able to defend ourselves against foreign attacks. Aircraft carriers are offensive weapons. They're force projection weapons, as I believe the, the term that's used. First off, 
I'm an I'm a libertarian. We believe that force is not the way to achieve things in the world. You achieve things through diplomacy. You need a strong military to back up diplomacy. But you don't start you don't start a, a discussion with somebody by drawing your gun. That's kind of the I guess the analogy I'd like to use. So we need a strong defense, but do we need one that's 19 times larger than, than the next largest military? I'm just comparing aircraft carriers there. Our military budget, uh, depending on when you look at it, uh, is the same size as between the next six and the next 12 countries in the list. We are number one. So, yeah, that's a place where you can save more than a dollar or a penny on a dollar. Yeah, yeah, and there's, um, now there's a lot of special interests, um, you know, and we have bases in Germany, South Korea, all around the world, so, you know, we're protecting Saudi Arabia, um, the Defense Department hasn't had an audit, I think, in a long time, or, or, or not that much of one. You know, there might be some consensus there, but there are a lot of districts all around the country that's you know we have so many bases i think it was like 800 bases but i guess there's some kind of special interests keeping them from being closed or keeping stuff from being reformed because it creates a lot of you know jobs and stuff like that so I, I, how do you feel about that i mean do you think there'd be a lot of pushback uh, or is that what you're going to challenge people on actually and say that um you know, it might be better in our national interests. The budget is more of a national defensive issue rather than, you know, this continuous spending per se. So let's step up a little and paint that with a broader brush. It's easier to talk about. Our military, our, our military budget, we have a lot of bases. We have a lot of things going on. We have entrenched generals that believe in aircraft carriers versus some other newer technology, drones on a smaller aircraft carrier. I'm making things up. But, but the point behind it is our federal government, if we're going to get to a balanced budget, Gary Johnson's initial take was that we need to cut 42%. Um, he's at less than that now. But we need to make huge cuts. Um, I would challenge everybody to go and play their own games with the budget. Uh, you can do that by going to a budget simulator like usa.abalancingact.com. And what you can do in there is you can go line item by line item and say, I don't want to pay for Department of Transportation rail. And you take it out and you see what happens to the budget. We are in such dire straits that I couldn't get the budget balanced until I started taking drastic measures with things that are, are normally considered untouchable and outside taxes. I couldn't get the budget to balance until I changed Social Security. That's how bad it is. And so we need somebody when a spending bill that is going to come up that says, no, I don't care what it is. Until we can live within our means, the answer to any new spending is no. And uh, the two parties in Congress aren't doing that. What I'm saying is the sequester, the, 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 uh, the uh, compromises that they've reached, they're not enough. They're not even close to enough. Sure. And uh, so that's – we're in unprecedented territory as far as the budget is going, you know, except maybe you said – in World War II for a brief period of time. And after World War II, the budget dramatically drops. And I think that's based on the budget versus as a percentage of GDP, which might not be even the most accurate way to think about it. Um, but let me ask you a little bit about your campaign for a bit. Uh, have you been in any debates so far? Are there any debates coming up for um, District 4 in Colorado, Bruce? There aren't. I'm running against an entrenched, an entrenched incumbent. The Republican Party has 
has owned the, the congressional district for for a very long time. There was a brief period of two years when a when a Democrat was in in office. I don't know, eight ten years ago. But beyond that, it's it's been solidly Republican for many many years. And so no, there's no debates. There's there's no reason for the Republican incumbent to debate against uh, either myself or my uh, uh, the Democratic challenger. Going out to Eastern Colorado, uh, it's 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 difficult. Do you know if the Republican incumbent has voted for any um, you know debt ceiling increases by any chance? He's. A Tea Party member. I think they have a different name now. And so he is one of the most fiscally responsible uh, members of com- Congress that there is, but he's still a Republican, and there are still things that the Republicans are voting for. So again, whether it's debt ceiling or, or whatever, that's not enough. Right, that's like the sequester. Uh, so what would make you the best candidate that differentiates you from this Republican or even Democrats? Um, I, I mean, I'm sure maybe civil liberties might be something that differentiates you a little bit from there. So I'll talk and about a, a couple of things in the budget. No, and the budget. I'm, I'm sure you might be even more fiscally uh, responsible than even a Tea Party Republican. Yeah, I would hope so. Yeah, and that, that's where I support Gary Johnson. Uh, you know, if he's if he's elected, he's promised to balance the budget within 100 days. And given his track record in New Mexico, uh, he might do it. And I don't think you'll hear that from anybody else. In my case, all that I can do is promise to veto any new spending um, on civil civil liberty kind of stuff um, um, I'm a former foster parent I have two kids that I adopted through the through the foster care system and so I've seen a lot of that side of, of government intervention into people's lives and and what kind of outcomes it has a couple of very interesting statistics I've seen them multiple places I've had them quoted to me by judges. Don't know whether they're accurate. The figures that I've seen quoted are that 30% of prison inmates come out of the foster care system. 30%. There's certainly not 30% of, of the population in general that's come out of the foster care system. 90%, 90% of kids that uh, emancipate out of the foster care system end up either incarcerated or homeless within a year definition of a failed system and so where I would be different I would be looking to change that system to something else um, the only thing that our foster care system has going for it is that it's recognized throughout the world as a as a uh, as a gold star or, or whatever system best best in the world but if the best in the world results in a 90 percent incarceration or homeless homeless rate that's unacceptable and so i have some ideas to change it i don't know whether they'll work but um, can you share that needs uh, to be looked at. those ideas sure one of them is is that instead of the government coming in and removing kids from people's homes that instead you pulls homes and i don't mean you put you know somebody that goes in and visits a home once a week i mean you put somebody in the home and that's not going to happen through the government that's got to be something where the government partners with faith-based organizations or community organizations or something like that where you find some way for the community to sponsor people to be in people's houses and you act as mentors. You act as people trying to give a hand up to the people who are who are in, in trouble. And frankly, uh, my experience in the foster care system, we talked about the war, war on drugs very, very briefly. This is an area where there's probably a huge advantage coming from a, from a libertarian kind of viewpoint. 
if you have a typical foster care system, there's probably six six people maybe that are in your house every week as a foster parent. There's more people that are dealing with the uh, the parents of kids. There's more people that are are uh, in the court system. I mean, it's just an unbelievable number of people that are involved. And so why are the kids getting taken away? Drugs. So you end the war on drugs. I can't say that, that the outcomes for kids will be any better. I can't say that family life will be any better. But at least you don't have the parents getting incarcerated. Yeah, at least not for that. Um and putting them in the same kind of place where there's murders and rapists and things like that. So how long have you been a libertarian, Bruce? Well, I've I've been a practicing libertarian since about 2000. I had a guy that I used to work with that, that convinced me that, uh, that uh, being a Republican was probably not where I really was. Um, I registered with the party in 2007, so I've been a libertarian um, of record for about nine years. And again, we're talking with Bruce Griffith, um, libertarian candidate in Colorado's 4th District, running for the U.S. House of Representatives. If you want to find out more information, um, it's BG, stands for his initials, Bruce Griffith, BG2016.org, O-R-G. Uh, have you challenged uh, you know, the Republican incumbent to a debate publicly and, um, you, you know, because I guess he has no incentive to have the debates if he's ahead, but I mean, it really seems like it's in his self-interest, not the interest of the districts to not debate. That's correct. Uh, no, I haven't challenged him and I don't think the, the democratic challenger has either. Let me ask you this. If the rules were reversed, let's say, you know, there's a wave of discontent you were elected, you know, you, you, you beat them out by whatever margin, and in two years from now, you know, your seat is up for re-election, and there's some, you know, Republican trying to challenge you. Would you and would you do the same thing? Would you just kind of hide out um, and uh, not debate, or would you offer debates to your opponents, even though you had the advantage, you're the incumbent? I mean, could you, would you promise to debate whoever your opponents are if the roles were reversed? I'll promise a lot more than that. Um, I'm not a professional politician. I don't ever want to become one. I'm an engineer by training, by desire, by whatever, and I view it as my civic duty uh, to run for Congress, and if I'm elected to serve uh, I feel guilty about every time I take well, anytime anybody offers to give me money, um, if you believe in my cause, I'll take money from you. If you believe in me, if it's a if it's a personal thing, then I I don't want the money. And and so the deal that will separate me is if I'm elected, I won't be spending my time in Washington raising money from my re-election bid. If my my record. Uh, my personality, uh, what I do in Washington should speak for itself. And so, yeah, I debate Ken and any other uh, challenger. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, he's not just denying you. He's denying the voters, um, I think, because you're on the ballot just as much as he is. The voters um, are using their taxpayer dollars to have your name printed on the ballots, etc. And so... You know, this is a public information, and, uh, you know, so I, I wouldn't quite 100% say that he's just not challenging you. He's not, kind of hiding from the voters, um, it seems, or not letting the voters hear all the candidates in a debate. A debate is pretty traditional, you know, before an election, and that's one of the main ways. In fact, that can be the main way um, that can decide an election that has happened many times in the past all the way from the Lincoln Douglas debates to, you know, Jesse Ventura and Ross Perot and, and, and so on. So kind of here, let me ask you a philosophical question then play the game that matters or whether you win or lose. 
if you're going to phrase it that way, I guess I would say it's how you play the game. It's the objective for me is to start a discussion about things, starting with some, some basic civics and, and get, get the public educated on, on what a representative can do and what a rep- representative can't do what uh what the president can do and what's not within his power and so um that's one of the key things that i want to get out into the debate um an example of that is is i don't think on my website you found anything about abortion i have very strong opinions about abortion but frankly they're my own um i've I've had a lot of voters come up to me and say, I'm going to decide based on, based on your position on abortion, what is it? And then they present me with two options. Are you pro-life or pro-choice? And I'm here to tell you there's more than two positions. I've talked with a lot of people about it, and there's probably at least five or six. There's two outcomes. The child dies or the child doesn't die. The mother has to carry an unwanted child or the mother doesn't have to carry an unwanted child. But uh, there's there's a lot of positions. There's there's a lot of things that people, uh, a lot of reasons why people want that to go one way or the other. And it's, it's more than just two. And so my position on it is that I'm running for the Federal House of Representatives. Um, that's a matter that's been decided. It's been decided for 50 years. The only thing that I can say about it is I will support the law of the land. That said, there really isn't much that a, that a representative can do to change that law of the land. Um, you can talk about whether the federal government funds some types of abortions, which will probably be deemed constitutional if if a bill is passed. But there's really not much that you can do to to change that that argument. There are things that can be done, but but not through the House of Representatives. And so... Sure, sure. And and it might be dishonest if someone's promising that they could, in other words, also, maybe. Or maybe just uninformed. Absolutely. The only thing that can happen at this point in time is somebody can initiate a constitutional amendment, which is mainly the responsibility of the states to ratify it. Uh, a representative can initiate the, the, the constitutional amendment, sort of, but it's not going to be able to get it passed. That's up to the states. So, And I don't think it would pass. So... That that's really not something that's within the purview of House of Representatives. Another thing that I hear is is uh, uh, selection of Supreme Court justices. House of Representatives doesn't have anything to do with that. That's so, the Senate, right? That's the Senate. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you see some people like just throwing out issues, you know, and uh, it has nothing to do with the position that they're running on. One thing that you might have is a little bit of a bully pulpit, perhaps, you know, and the ability to investigate things as a congressperson and bring certain issues to light that are unseen, you know, and um, and let me questions here. One about when well, just kind of roll this into one trade uh you know you hear some talk about the tpp should you know trade is good the more that we trade with other countries less likely we'll go to war with them but then again you know you haven't read the whole tpp because uh it's written in closed smoke-filled rooms so i'm gonna ask you about that and also how that would affect small and mid-sized businesses and overall you know you know what should what can we possibly what is the role of the federal governments and creating an environment that would be uh, productive to small and mid-sized businesses? Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. I think the first and foremost thing that the government needs to do is get out of the way. Um, it's not the job of the federal federal government 
there's a document that says what the federal government for, and it's pretty darn short. Um, some of the first 10 amendments amount to one sentence, um, and there's nothing in there about the federal government promoting or, or not promoting small business. That said, um, I've been a small business owner, not the principal owner, owned portions of small businesses. Um, the most recent one that I was in, I owned a 10% stake. Rose up to be a multi-million dollar business um, and then crashed. But probably the single biggest thing that affected me through that was the Small Business Administration. One of the things that the Small Business Administration is supposed to do is promote small business. Um, they're supposed to give small business a leg up. And so what they did for us is they offered us a loan. Great. The easiest way for us to get money. Small businesses are cash starved. Um, they need operating capital so that they can expand the business, so that they can grow the business, so that they can make it successful. Um, so we got a fairly hefty small business loan. And then came the problem. As part of getting the loan, once, once we were offered the loan, they made all of the owners sign personal guarantees on the loan, which completely eliminates all the protections that were put in place to uh, make small businesses a risk for owners that's worth taking. Um, if, the small, if, if the owner of the small business is protected, if the small business goes bankrupt, um, then there's a lot more incentive to to try something than there is if the small business owner knows that when the business goes bankrupt, he's going to have to pay the, the debt. And that's, in fact, what my company did. We paid off all of our debts. The, the pool of owners, we paid the debts. Um, so we didn't leave the government holding the bag. We didn't try. We just agreed to pay it off. So at any rate, that's one of the things that's an impediment to small and medium businesses is, is cash flow. Um, you're saddled with about three choices. You can go to a, an angel investor who's going to take a big portion of – they're going to take the risk and they're also going to take the profits. Um, and so why would you try this new great idea that you've got um, you know, and try something out when you know you're not going to get anything out of it. Um, another choice is to go the consulting route where you start a business as some more mundane thing where you know that you're going to get money. And then the, the siren song that you hear from that is that uh, why would I then ever do the product or the, 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 the other path that I'm trying to raise money for when I'm making money as a, as a consulting business? And then the other is, is you end up with predatory lenders. So none of those are very good choices. And what about trade? Um, do you think, uh, you know, would you, do you, how do you feel about the TPP based on what you know about it so far, if you have any feelings on it at all? <laughs> I'll go into another one of my sermons. Um, any bill that's a thousand pages long, is about 999 pages too long. I, I got a bill, helped get a bill passed uh, through Colorado legislature, and it amounted to about two sentences, um, and it made a huge difference. Um, it allowed people to get health care, health insurance. It allowed my small business, members of my small business, to get health insurance. Weird thing in Colorado, but bills can be small. They, they don't have to be a thousand pages long. They don't have to be such that nobody can understand what's, what's really being changed. And so there's a lot of things in the TPP and, and other trade bills. I'm a libertarian. I have been uh, coerced to believe, <laughs> um, I do believe, that free and open trade is the best way. Um, get the government out of things it doesn't belong in. So that means free and open trade. Free and open trade means free and open trade with all comers. 
and and that should be able to be written on just uh, one page or a couple of pages, not you know. I, I think it's over a thousand pages. I'm sure. Um, so, do you think? Um, let me ask you this, just as a issue of fairness, basically. I mean, you don't you you won't really be. I, I guess have legislation matters in this. Should Gary Johnson and or Jill Stein be in the presidential debates? Absolutely. I didn't see the one tonight. Um, I was at another meeting, but uh, the first one I was listening to it on a on the way to a an event down in Denver, and um, a Gary Johnson thing, as a matter of fact, and it sounded like a circus. the The quote that I hear consistently is, "Wouldn't it be nice to have a an adult in the room?" So yeah, I, they're they're on the ballot. Gary Johnson's polling, you know, higher than anybody's been since Ross Perot. Um, there's a there's a fairly good chance that he's going to take some electoral votes. The first time I think since George Wallace. So, should he be in the in the debates? Absolutely. Should Jill Stein be in the debates? Absolutely. Um, they've both got significant national followings. They're both on the ballot. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that I, consistency of saying that she should be in there as well, even if you might not agree with her policies, um, you know, uh, but you would still think that she should be in the debates. Um, okay, so I have two more questions for you, Bruce. Um, one is, um, and, and it's all right to say you don't know, you don't have enough facts or whatever, but uh, what about... Someone like Edward Snowden, and maybe not him specifically, but um, you know, do you think uh, he would receive a fair trial if he came back to the U.S.? And more broader asking about whistleblowers in general, whether they're a federal government contractor or they're actually in the federal government, do they, like I think Hillary Clinton said, he should have went up the right channels, but he was arguing in return that, um, you know, he didn't feel like there were any right channels. So how is it important to, uh, you know, have the integrity of our government to allow whistleblowers um, to have proper channels and uh, without feeling that they're going to get, you know, retribution or, or stuff like that? Uh, Edward Snowden is a difficult one. He released tons of classified information. Um, that makes him a traitor. Um, however, um, let's take an easier example. Um, if you look at NASA and look at the Columbia and Challenger accidents, there were whistleblowers. They were uh, not given a voice. People said the O-rings were flawed, shouldn't be, uh, um, that they should be looked at. It didn't happen. Was there retribution? Should there be retribution? In in most commercial businesses, I've worked in a, a bunch of large companies. And as a matter of fact, some of the biggest defense contractors, I worked for Lockheed Martin at one point in time. In every one that I know of, there are ethics organizations where you get a free call. You can report on your boss. You can report on your coworkers. You can report on anybody. I don't know of a case where they've been used. I, I have no personal information of a case where they've been used in any of the companies that I've worked for. But, um, yeah, there should be a path. Um, it shouldn't be ignored. Uh, there shouldn't be retaliation against the whistleblower. And uh, as far as Snowden goes, yeah, I understand why he did what he did. Um, if he were to come back in the United States, w what should happen to him? I don't know. I'd leave that to the courts um, and w weigh the good against the bad. That's what courts are for. Um, that's why you have juries. Juries are supposed to weigh why you did what you did against what you did and even if you did it. It's not just up to the jury to say, yes, you did it or no, you didn't. Yeah, and so he would deserve a jury trial, I, I, I assume. And um, 
and about whistleblowers, like if the chain of, you know, the process, um, maybe it should be an independent, like they can report things to an independent body. That way they don't feel like, you know, it's internal and um, it might not go anywhere. If it was some third party, you know, that might have its own oversights or something like that. So there's a uh, believe yeah. the, the companies that I've worked for, that's the way it works. It's okay. uh, like a chairman of the board level organization that's completely independent from, from any line is what they're called organization. And I think that's true of, of NAFA and uh, the military as well. As I remember signs around military facilities that say, call this number if, you know, whatever. So I think right. it exists. That doesn't mean anybody would pay attention. Yeah. You hear about some people in the FBI, you know, that were following terrorists and stuff, and, and they're trying to report it to their, you know, and you might have some people that are just give some frivolous reports, but at the same time, you might have some people giving very legitimate um, reports as well. So uh, it'd probably be good to pay attention to them all and take them seriously. Um, well, let me ask you this, Bruce. Um, who are some of your favorite people, past or present? Well, one guy that I don't know a whole, about, whole lot about personally, but I see what he's doing, and um, I, I think what he's trying to do is really cool. Um, that would be Elon Musk when he's uh, – I forget about – he's got a sub-shuttle type thing that he's been uh, promoting out in California, and he's trying to get private investment into it. Sub-shuttle meaning a, a tube where you could like drill a, drill a tunnel from uh, – I'm not sure where he's planning uh, – up the coast of California, you – take all the pressure out of the tube and you've got this really high tech, really low energy, really fast transportation between say San Francisco and Los, Al Los Angeles. That's really cool. That's really cool stuff that I wish more people were into. He's been talking about uh, going to Mars. Um, he's got SpaceX. He's got a couple of companies that he's created from nothing. And, um, He's turned them in, into something, Tesla being the best-known one. He's also got the, the uh, solar company that's putting solar panels on, you know, a quarter of the houses in my neighborhood. That's uh, another really cool thing. As far as uh, past leaders, I guess I'd have to look at somebody like Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he's a guy that came into the presidency. They were trying to get him out of New York became vice president to, to get him out of the way, came into the presidency and did some really cool things. Um, created the National Park Service, busted up a bunch of uh, uh, government-granted, well, a bunch of not government-granted monopolies. Um, not very libertarian, but he got things done. Yeah, he also won the Nobel Peace Prize from preventing a war between, I think, Russia and Japan or Russia and China or something like that, too. So, um, a very interesting figure. Uh, yeah, Elon Musk, uh, I saw an interview with him the other day, and they were asking him what are some of the things he would want for government. And one of the things he said that I remember was that he wished whenever a new law was passed, every law should have a sunset provision and people would have to re-vote on it if they wanted to keep it. But, uh, yeah, a very interesting person. Well, Bruce, good to talk with you today, and we do appreciate your time to let the people know and our audience know who's on the ballot, uh, you know, where you're coming from, where you want to take uh, the country, per se. Um, any other any events coming up in the next, uh, I guess, you know, there's about 35 days or so until the election and so any events coming up here in District 4 in Colorado? Not really that I can talk about it or uh, that I can talk about it at the moment, but um, got several things going on in papers and things like that. So I should be uh, in the Greeley Tribune here pretty quickly. I should be in Boulder Weekly. Denver Post, I think, has a, an election guide coming out very soon. Uh, maybe on the radio coming up here in uh, – 
uh, Sterling in the next couple of weeks. So it may be, um, if, if you, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, maybe if, um, and people can find out more information uh, at um, BG, which stands for Bruce Griffith, BG2016.org. Um, maybe it might be worth just having a debate between you and the Democrat if the Republican is, you know, just going to forfeit out of it. Uh, you might just get some extra news out of it, you know, after all, and get more issues heard and be something still worth doing. Uh, although it would be good to have the Republican there as well, but it looks like, you know, they might, uh, sounds like they're forfeiting out. Uh, hopefully that can happen. I know there's short time, but Good luck in your campaign, and we really appreciate you taking the time and letting people know, you know, there are other options on the ballot, and you did get on the ballot. So, you know, if you're into U.S. politics, if you're into um, what's happening in Colorado and also Colorado's 4th District, we're talking to one of the people who are on the ballot, uh, Bruce Griffith. Bruce, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure, and we appreciate you being here today. All right, and thank you. I appreciate the, the opportunity to be on your show. Yeah, let me just ask you, uh, just any final words of wisdom, sir? Um, no, think about uh, voting your conscience rather than, uh, rather than uh, picking the lesser of two evils or the lesser of one or, or many evils. Vote for the guy who's, who matches your beliefs. Vote for the guy who you believe has integrity probably matters a whole lot more than what party they belong to. You know, and it's probably a lot easier to do that in a congressional race than for president. So that's why it's very important. That's why we're interviewing congressional uh, candidates. You know, uh, there's a lot of time being spent about the presidential candidates and not nearly enough, you know, for a co-equal branch for Congress. A lot less risk if, if you're concerned about you know, making your vote counts and, um, you, you know, to actually vote your conscience uh, that way. Well, take care, and uh, I hope you have a nice evening, Bruce. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you.